Welcome to Casual Chat with Brian Germain. Our guest today is Robert Kittila, who is an old friend of mine, an amazing human being, and I know you're just going to love him. Um, he has recently created a brand new uh, system for para paragliding. Now, he's been teaching this stuff for a long, long time, but to, to make the leap from a user to manufacturer is brave and scary and admirable, in my opinion. Uh, and his new unit is astounding. It really is groundbreaking. Uh, and uh, this is why uh, he sent us a little video ahead of time so that you can take a peek at it. Uh, its uh, first flight was just uh, two weeks ago. And we join Robert now uh, mid-conversation uh, due to a slight technical uh, glitch. And uh, let's hear what he has to say about his new fantastic machine. Ready to travel so you could pull the strings and get a, 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 a little, like a cushion on a, on a carbon plate that would come up and go right under your, your thighs. So you'd have this incredibly comfortable uh, lazy boy up in the air that would cradle you. And if you crashed, it wouldn't twist you. The impact would be distributed throughout your whole body instead of this. Yeah. And so uh, uh, two weeks ago, I, I flew it and uh, it, it turned out to be better than I ever hoped. So not only was it safer and more comfortable, but the, the manufacturing process will be a lot simpler because there is no frame. The yeah. carbon seat is the frame. Yeah. And then the motor plate is bolted to the carbon seat. So you get rid of the whole frame and then you have a, a piece underneath that raises the seat off the ground that becomes like a crumple zone. Right. And then there are wheels, no powered paraglider, uh, no paramotor has wheels. And would you buy a suitcase without wheels? Yeah, there you go. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a, a paramotor weighs a lot more than a suitcase. So it does. Yeah. 65 pounds more in many cases. Right. So exactly. What, what interests me about this whole thing and, and, and you know, kind of what we're aiming for in, in this casual chat general topic is the, the, the expansion of the human consciousness into creativity, into creative solutions against the natural resistance of fear and the, what I call the yeah, but mind, right? The yeah, but says, who am I? to design a better parachute, a better paraglider, a better nuclear reactor. You know, I'm just little old me. And yet, uh, we, if people don't have enough of a sense of self and enough of a, a deliberate focus on bravery despite fear. Well, I, you were a, a, a big inspiration uh, to me because you designed the airlocks, which was completely revolutionary in, in uh, uh, parachute design. And I figured, well, if my buddy Brian can do it, you know, I can do it. And that was 10 years ago. And, you know, sleepless nights and countless thousands of dollars and a, a pile probably 10 feet yeah. high of, of bad prototypes get yeah. to where I am now. I right. mean, every day I question, you know, am I doing the right thing? There was fear. There's yeah. fear in every step. And I had nothing to go by. I couldn't copy anything on the market because to me it was all wrong. So I had to uh, have a blank sheet of paper and start from scratch redesigning a paramotor. And yeah. that's scary. It is scary. It's appropriately scary because it's actually a physical danger, um, which is yeah. in some ways more tangible because you can say, all right, let's take a step back. What do I need to do right now to improve the safety of this? I can ask those questions and focus on the details. And right. For me, that's, I mean, maybe that you're the same way. You know, if I'm going to fly off of a mountain or jump out of a plane or anything like that, if I can get this laser beam focus on the details of the situation and use my logical mind and methodically go down that list. Absolutely. And uh, at first, uh, the, it was scary, but the more you more work you put in it, it becomes a spiritual thing it becomes a very zen thing yeah. the whole design process because at first you go oh i'm going to try this and that failed and then you're going to you go oh my god uh, i'm going to try this and by the sixth try you're like oh my god you know 
what's this Zen thing? I'm failing and failing and failing. And then you step back and you realize each failure mm -hmm. is a learning step. Yeah. You learned a shitload from those failures. Yes, exactly. And those little steps that you, you failed in, later on, you can use those failures in other aspects of the design. Yeah. And, and it's, it's after a while, you just go in, you go, mm, and the design happens by itself. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's huge. What you hit on there is the idea that, that it doesn't have to be my ego that's being injured by the failure. This is not about me. This is about ideas expanding. Exactly. And I have to take the risks. And when I fail, I just say, good, I just learned where the path is not. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I learned uh, 20 ways not to design a power motor. Right, exactly. So, so far. Yeah, exactly, but the hard thing is, now that I've got to this point, now I have to fine-tune it to make it look completely obvious. Yeah, yeah. And that's the hard part, you know. Right. It should look like people, and people who have seen my design, they go, well, duh, of course it's supposed yeah. to be. Like you know? <laughs> well, the so, first, yeah, the, par the paramotor that you modified and modified that I ended up flying uh, in Longmont had those little, it was like rollerblade wheels or something on the back of it. It was like, mm -hmm. well, duh, why do I need to carry the thing when I can just roll it? These are, these are uh, easy things to, to, to take a look at and go, well, of course, that's the right way. But it takes a brave uh, sort of forward thinking mind that everybody's capable uh, of being to say, let's, let's throw away assumptions. Let's, exactly. not, let's, let's not assume that everything is the way it should be, that it is the way that it you know, could be in terms of its, its best form. It could be better. Absolutely, and, and, and that, takes, that takes a leap of faith. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm starting to grow uh, a second layer of skin because I'm going to do a video and introduce this whole thing, but then show the whole, all the steps that led to this design. Yep. And I'm going to face resistance yep. like never before. Everybody, yep. all the naysayers are going to jump on me with both feet and yes. uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to defend myself yep. and I'm ready for it because yep. I think what I've designed is the future of the sport. Of course. Yes. Yeah. I mean, to, to, if your pure idea is let's protect the pilot, you know, that, that is your fundamental motivation is let's make this sport parent paragliding is, is actually uh, safer than many of the extreme sports out there, but, you know, if you, if you take a collapse down low or you have a stall and spin in or something, you want to know that, that uh, you know, throwing a reserve is not your only hope. Right, right. And even, if, even if you throw a reserve inside of some of these fairly lightweight cages, um, you're going to get hurt. Yeah, because you're not, you're not cocooned. And that's what the seat does is, is it cocoons you. And, and flying that thing, you feel like Superman up, up there because you go... Shit, nothing can harm me, you know. You you're, you you have this exoskeleton that's protecting yeah. you, and it gives you maybe too much confidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's I can deal with that, right? Just like when people yeah. say, "Oh, I got my airlock canopy, and it feels so good. I flew it into a thunderhead because I felt so confident." And I go, "No, that's not <laughs> what I made it for. I was trying to reduce your danger level." in normal circumstances, not uh, give you authority to put yourself in greater danger, but exactly, exactly. We can deal with those risks, you know, it, but it, what, what's occurring to me right now is an idea that repeats for me is that when I'm going into uncomfortable places, these, these novel places of creation, um, where uncertainty is stirring my fear and my question marks, I don't know if, should I move forward or not? If I have, uh, sort of pulling me forward this path of service that I'm, I'm actually trying to help. I'm actually trying to make the world a better place that it's bigger than me. I get braver. Absolutely. And, and I noticed in the design process, as soon as your ego goes in and you go, oh, this is going to show those guys. <laughs> Failure yeah. right there. You yeah. have to, exactly what you say, this is to make the sport better. Yeah. And, and, and if this can help people stay safer and save backs from breaking, yeah. even if I save one back, 
yeah. uh, the 10 years of, of gray hair and, and sleepless <laughs> nights will be worth it. Of course it will be. Yeah. It, 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 one of the things that I try to remind uh, teachers and, and leaders and designers is that if you can focus on your market, not just as a bunch of numbers, you know, a, a number of potential sales or, or whatever, um, and go beyond it and look at the individuals. The, the, I love skydivers. I really love skydivers. I, the powered paragliding community, the rock climbing community, the, the, all of these adventure folks, and you extend that even further out. I love human beings. And, and that is, uh, I think it's a, it's a unifying fundamental motivation that can push us forward into meaning. Yeah, and you, you touched on something. It, it's not about the money. I mean, if somebody ends up buying this and, uh, you know, I team up with somebody to manufacture and I make back some of the money I put in, great. Yeah. But the, the goal is not money. In fact, this country is obsessed with money. Yeah. I mean, everybody talks about money. You go to a coffee shop, people are talking, oh, this cost, this, this cost, that. I was in France for shoulder surgery from a paragliding accident. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I talked to a bunch of French people while I was healing up. You know, I'd go to cafes and, and sit and, and chat with mm. the French. Yeah, the French <laughs> don't talk about money. It's vulgar in France to talk about money. Interesting. And I thought that was, that was really interesting. I just got back from Cuba. Same thing there. You do not talk about money. Mm -hmm. yeah. interesting. But here, it's all about money. Well, I think there's a lot of fear around money here. Uh, you know, in, in the Wild West where there is no safety net, you know, if you, if you get hurt or you can't work or whatever, sometimes if you've been working for you know, a larger company, you can get some sort of support. But you know, getting old, getting pregnant, running out of money, you're, you can be in big trouble in this country. Yeah, but, but then again, you know, when I met with a surgeon in France uh, who was going to operate on my, my arm and put together my muscles and tendons in my shoulder, you know, we sat down and he said, okay, here, sign the contract, you know. And it was one page and a few questions and I signed it. And I said, uh, what about the liability thing? And he looked at me and he said, there are no guarantees in life. Yeah. And I said, good, let's do surgery. Yeah. Yeah, there are. And, and that attitude was so nice. The hospital was great. The nurses were great. They came in and they were singing and they were smiling. <laughs> there was never this liability fear that, oh my God, I'm going to get sued if I do this and that didn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the surgeon, for your record, Mm -hmm. didn't operate with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the way people would perceive, you know. Like, yeah, you know, wine and smoking a cigarette. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, not that. <laughs> well, it's interesting that when you talk about, you know, the, the fear in America, because, I mean, you've lived in a lot of different places, right? Yes. You were raised initially in Finland, and you lived in uh, Espana, right? For Spain, and I went to high school in Sweden, and I was born in Japan. So yeah, there you, well, there you go. So you, you're you're more of a mutt than even I am. So, <laughs> would you say that Americans suffer from fear more than some other countries or most other countries? Oh yeah, I would say so because because of the whole money thing and the whole uh, litigation system, mm -hmm. there is fear everywhere to get sued. And, and I think that's going to be the downfall of this country is this whole litigious society. Mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, I mean, when I lived in Sweden and Finland, your word was, your word and a handshake was everything. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have a friend who, who worked for British Airways and he was um, posted, um, they were supposed to move to Glasgow because they wanted him to have that as a headquarters. So he sent his wife to buy a, a house in um, Glasgow. So she went up and she found a beautiful little cottage, an old gentleman, Scottish gentleman, and they came uh, to an agreement of her price. And uh, um, she went back to London and everything was great. And they were getting ready to move. And the airline said, sorry, no, we made a mistake. You're staying here in London. Hmm. And he goes, but we're, we're going to buy a house and the, we, we cut a deal with the Scottish guy. And they said, did you shake on it? <laughs> and he asked his wife and she said, yes. 
That's binding in quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that I don't, I haven't given up on America. I haven't. No, no, I haven't either. But I've given up on the way things have been as the way to the future. I think that we need to be learning from other countries, not to say that we don't have some gems because America does have some very specific, beautiful things that are serving the world, not just- Absolutely. America. But there's so much about the, 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 this poverty mentality of lack, I notice is, is uh, kind of all pervasive and it's not serving because it doesn't generate money. <laughs> you know, when you feel like you're running out, you push money away. And, I, and when you feel like you're about to get attacked by terrorists, you see terrorists everywhere too. I know. And, and, and uh, I fault the media for that because, I mean, television, it's money, it's stock market, the stocks are going up, you know, this and that, and the health insurance is costing this much. You know, uh, and people go to college. I see it here at CU in Boulder. You know, they're going to become lawyers because lawyers can make lots of money and be miserable in their life. Uh, yeah. Confucius, very wise man, once said, he who loves what he does mm -hmm. never works a day in his life. And you can attest to that. I can attest to that. I do photography. I do video. I do product design. Um, I ship uh, these motor mounts all over the world to pilots. And that brings me tremendous happiness. I, I don't make a ton of money, but knowing that I'm shipping a product to pilots in Taiwan or in, in you know, uh, Italy or, or Algiers, yeah. it brings me a certain happiness because I know they're not happy with, with their product and I'm sending something that's going to last for years, look great, have beautiful colors, and uh, is going to serve them well for you know, five, six, seven, yeah. maybe more, longer, you know, yeah. Yeah, there it is. So yeah. happiness is, is relative. And, and this chasing the almighty buck doesn't guarantee happiness at no, all. No, it doesn't. And I'm, I'm realizing that I have spent some time in my life, a lot of it, sort of blaming and vilifying the media, blaming the movies, blaming the violent video games. And yes, I believe that that is the, has been the cause of so many of our woes in this world, the, the metastasis of the negative aspects of, of Western culture. But we have a buffer called choice where we can turn it off, for instance. We can Absolutely. choose not to react. We can choose not to be played um, in, this, uh, in this game of, I make you afraid so you buy the thing that makes you feel safer. You know, I, I can have a little buffer where I take a step back from what I'm observing and not have it, have, you know, puppet strings over me. Uh, and Absolutely. We, everybody has that choice. Yeah, and, and it's, it's funny because uh, my wife, Mindy, who we just got married, mm -hmm. uh, we decided Sunday is a no tech day. Yeah. No computers, no phones. We turn everything off. And we go for walks, I go flying, whatever, but no technology. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. We, there's an organic component that needs to be nurtured. You know, mm -hmm. the human being needs to be interacting with their environment, not through the interface of an electronic device, where you have your feet on the ground or your feet hanging in a harness, who cares? But you're out there in the world focusing on things that are real. Yeah, and beautiful. Yep. Well, that's a big one, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, as a photographer, as a, as a filmmaker, I mean, your, your eye for beauty is maybe more evolved than some. Well, I think if you obsess uh, on it for, you know, 30, 40 years, yeah, uh, you, you kind of expand your vision and you start seeing things a little differently. Yep. And uh, you certainly see through the media and advertising and, you know, pill sales, sales on television and all that stuff. I mean, you just step back and go, this is complete bogus, you know? Yeah. And yeah. it is. Uh, it's the mighty dollar again, you know? Just sell something to people, promise them whatever with a million side effects as long as we can make our money. Well, none of that works if, and this is, this is my firm belief, if people decide that their own happiness 
is based on their own choices, their own thoughts, their, what they give their attention to. And that creates this internal locus of control where you decide, you know, I don't, I don't need anything outside myself. Even if I'm choosing to do something that maybe makes me feel better, like jump out of an airplane, I do feel great when I do it, but am I not capable of jumping out of an airplane in a bad mood and have a less great skydive? Sure, I'm capable of that. So my, it's still my choice to be happy, to, to look for beauty, to see the world in that way. But, but jumping out of a plane is a great, great thing because uh, what we strive for and, and like Buddhists strive for and uh, people in a meditative state strive for is being in the moment. Yeah. And when you jump out of a plane, that minute you're free falling or 40 seconds of your head down, <laughs> you are completely in the moment. It's, and that's a spiritual, spiritual thing. It's this thing, yeah. right? You, I mean, you leave the airplane and you're yeah. absolutely focused. That's right. And not just on the one thing, but the surround simultaneously, right? The inside and the outside is all hyper aware. Right. And that's the, the goal of med meditation too, is to be totally aware and in the moment, right? You do a lot of meditation. Yeah. I live in Boulder. You know, it's... Uh, right. You're, it's required, you know. <laughs> there's, there's like some sort of a law, probably. Yeah, yeah. It is. Well, I think that it's all meditation if you're absolutely focused in a deliberate way uh, towards clearing yourself and being in this present moment with, with uh, a deeper awareness than where your mind would naturally go with the scatterbrain Western, you know, multi-focused mind. And I find that also when I'm, when I'm doing uh, really exciting photography, whether it's on location or in the studio, I'll, I'll turn on some music and I'll, I'll just go in there and time will just fly by and all of a sudden I have this great picture and I can't remember how I got it, but there it is. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of took itself, yeah. even though I'm arranging the light and the props and composition and all that. You, you time and space takes on a totally different meaning and uh, all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, I didn't eat lunch, uh, right. it's dinner time, it's dark outside, <laughs> oh my God, what happened? And uh, you, you find that editing videos too, it's, it's oh, yeah. get in the flow and time and space takes on a whole different meaning and it's, it's wonderful, it's, it's like a drug. It, it, um, uh, it, it energizes you and gives you a high. Yeah, it's like a passion leading us, you know, where the, the goal is to pursue beautiful things like, you know, I mean, the, the, the tricks of light, you know, that's beautiful things. When I'm out in nature, pursuing that beauty, when I'm trying to create a video where, of course, I give, you know, full props to you for teaching me how to make, <laughs> make movies, really. Um, with our first collaboration of uh, Vertical but Journey. Ma making a, a great cut. Yeah. That is seamless and it is bigger than both cuts uh, individually. It, the meaning just is stronger. And then you put some music on it and it just like takes on a whole life of its own. Yeah. That's a huge high. You just massage it and play with it and do it again and again and clear your mind again, clear your mind again. What is it that I'm intending to do? Right? Exactly. The feeling that I'm aiming for, not what it is, what do I want it to be? Exactly. And that's bigger than just putting the clips on a timeline. It's the big picture. Yep. And, and uh, that's very rewarding, I find, too. It is. It, but it takes a certain kind of, of uh, it's a choice. I think everybody's capable of this to, to decide ahead of time that you're reaching for something a little bit bigger, better and bigger than the mundane. You're reaching to create something that is exceptional, that stands on its own, even after you're gone. As, yeah, as yeah. that's really special. <laughs> you know, you know what's funny is uh, the other day I stumbled upon uh, the '95 World Freefall Convention, which is like 20 was, years ago, and I watched it, and it still kept my interest. I was like, "This is yeah. pretty cool." <laughs> yeah, that was a work of art. Yeah, that it was. You did amazing. Now you did more than one, correct, uh, Quincy? Yeah, I did. I did '95 and '97, I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Amazing. Um, I mean, the, the one that you did with the, uh, the history of skydiving, Sir Thomas Baldwin, right? Yes. Working, I do remember working up to the final, you know, this is what skydiving is today. I think it's nice to, to, to put things into perspective that way. Right. And, and uh, to me, the whole sport was brand new. I mean, I hadn't made a jump when I, left, when I came to Quincy and it was pouring. I remember driving up and going, what? What the hell am I doing here? I don't know anything about the sport. And then, uh, you know, you and Max Doretta and yeah, uh, a, uh, a few other people kind of introduced me to the sport. And so I had to, this, the blinders came off and I had to capture everything and tell a story from a Wolfo's perspective. Yeah. And of course, I made my first tandem uh, jump at Quincy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that opened the whole thing and then I became a jumper and so on and so forth. But so uh, it begins. It, it, it was a great journey. I mean, it, it, the, the beginning of the journey was phenomenal. Well, you already had the heart of a skydiver. I mean, it's, I, I believe that there's a certain type of person that just naturally, you can plug them into a, a kayak on a, you know, a, a snowboard. You can put them in, in any of these situations. And given the specific information that they need to kind of work that machine, they're going to get good at it pretty quickly. You know, they're, they're going to fit with it. Uh, in, in I would, it would be interesting to spend more time thinking about what that personality type is. And I believe anybody can sort of nurture those characteristics. But mm -hmm. what is it about the adventure soul uh, that, that makes one, I don't know, fit well with these things and not create more catastrophe, more fear, more problems? Well, it started early for me. I mean, uh, I remember at 13, uh, we lived in Spain and uh, we went to Pamplona. My, my dad took the family to Pamplona to see the, the bullfights and the runnings of the bull and stuff. And I jumped in and went and ran with the bull at 13. <laughs> and that was a, an adrenaline rush. And then I ended up uh, when I was like 15, 16, up to 19. I think I went six times to Pamplona and, and ran with my friends. And... Uh, uh, that will get your adrenaline going. Well, and, and it, it makes me wonder if, if, you know, some of our viewers are not, you know, of that mentality, would they not label you an adrenaline junkie? And would you accept that term? Or would you call it something yeah. different? I think it's a very general statement. I think uh, adventure seeker would probably be a better title because you know, that led to all kinds of, I still play hockey, which I consider an extreme sport, yep. especially at my age, <laughs> uh, and snowboarding and skiing and surfing. I went to Hawaii like 15 times on uh, surf trips. Uh, so uh, they, and the thing is, then I came to Colorado and I didn't have my surfing, which was mm -hmm. the biggest thing I missed, but as luck has it, I, I, I fell into skydiving and... Yeah. Uh, and snowboarding. I mean, yeah. I've, I've written with you. I mean, you're the guy that taught me how to snowboard. That's right. <laughs> and the way that you taught me was a sort of a, a very surfing way to think of it. The sort of surrender method of find your balance and lead with your weight and don't fight it and be graceful. Well, right, flow with it. Smooth, wide turns. Yeah, which is, which is surfing. And, and a lot of big wave surfers are... Uh, uh, snowboarders yeah because yeah. it's the same kind of flow yeah and it's in it's a way of life I yeah would, I, totally. would, I would add <laughs> totally instead of struggling and doing it the hard way and that's a scary thing for somebody that might be living in a cubicle you know they do their they do their job and, and that's okay there's a lot of skydivers that i meet that they make their money in a job that maybe they don't absolutely love but then they apply it on the weekends. Uh, they apply that money to these passions. And that's, that's a choice. It's okay. But if they want to make the leap, you know, we call cutting away <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, into a life of, of, of passion uh, that's fueled by meaning, not just, uh, you know, jumping towards your responsibility, but jumping towards an inner responsibility towards a passion driven life. Right. Right. It's scary for many people. But it's so rewarding when you do it. it yeah. It's so rewarding because there again, you're doing what you love mm -hmm. and you're never working. Yeah. You yeah. know? 
Is but, what I, but what do I do when I run out of money? They say, you know, I got bills to pay. I got, you know, a roof to keep over my head. They say, you, know? you have to just trust. And, and that's a really, that's another thing that's really hard is, is learning to trust and being a freelancer. I never know where my next job is coming from, but at the end of the month, I always have money and there's a little money left over to get some, you know, uh, gels and stuff to, to carbon, make some carbon part for my, my machine. Mm -hmm. And I've never really worried about it. Money is not important to me. Yeah. The, the, the joy I get is from creating beautiful things, whether it's photography, whether it's a video, whether it's a product that's going to help the sport or whether it's making stupid little motor mounts. Yeah. Yeah. Those little, Oh yeah. You should show them. I think they're, they're awesome. Yeah. With the disco uh, colors, awesome. Yeah, red colors, they're polyurethane and they have a mechanical lock inside. For his powered paragliding, uh, so where the motor mounts to the framework. Yeah, and it, it takes, takes down the, normally the motor shake like this. Yeah, knock your fillings loose, it's so Yeah, <laughs> and, and this, it does this. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, uh, plus it lasts for years, you can pour gasoline on it and oh, uh, it comes in orange and blue and red and all these beautiful colors. So you match it to your frame or your wing or your suit or whatever. And it becomes a fashion item. <laughs> so, well, you see, what I, what I love is, the, is folks like you that, that are not afraid about the money issue, that have this trust in the way that you know, somebody walking through the forest without a headlamp sort of trusting that the ground's going to be under their feet. I will just keep moving and trust and, and pay attention to the details and have a bottomless pit of motivation to do whatever it takes to get to that next, uh, that next dollar. And it's not about the dollar anyway. The dollar is a means yeah. to a new experience. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, but that's, that's an angle that needs to be shared. But you know, it can be very scary at first. It can be very scary to just yeah. change that mindset and trust that it's going to be yeah. there. And uh, you do the best you can, no matter what job it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the money will be there. And, you know, and then you can do, yeah. you have to do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. Right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and of course, when it's a passion driven life, everything you're doing is somewhere within that spectrum of what I want to do. It's just some things are maybe not quite as much fun. I mean, I love to sew uh, unless I have to sew 40 hours a week and then I kind of want to skydive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm sewing parachutes and so the whole thing has meaning. The exactly. Whole, exactly. The whole thing is this path of service and I'm, I'm creating something that flies. You know, I mean, I made your parachute. In, yeah. And then number I remade two. it. Samurai after. number two. Yeah, Samurai number two. And I've, re I've remade it, you know, since I changed the... You yeah, still have to put that patch on that says number two. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I have it here somewhere, don't I? I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to send that back. So, but yeah, I think that that's, that's the message I hope to get through here is the, the fear of going forward into a life that is a little bit uncertain, but it's a lot meaningful. Um, it's yeah, but it's also exciting because you don't know what's around the next corner. Yeah. And, and, and you have to embrace, just like you embrace the failures, yep. you have to embrace the excitement of what's around the next corner. Yeah. And it can be something absolutely wonderful. And the more you trust it, the more wonderful it's going to be. I think you hit something really big right there, which is that you can take a high adrenaline situation, a high risk situation, might be physical risk or otherwise, doesn't matter. And I can, I can receive that as, oh, this is scary. Or I can say, wow, this is exciting. Yeah. Big yeah. difference. Big difference. Big because one of them makes me sort of paralyzed and uncreative. The other method is reaching forward with my energy into the, the ways in which I can make this better, where I can be, uh, I can have guidance in terms of my choices and I'm in the mood where I can hear my wisdom. Right. And, and isn't our purpose here on earth to learn and experience new things? Yeah. To, to me, that's, that's it. And, and, and every day is like, 
I wake up and I go, oh my God, what am I going to learn today? I can't wait to get to my studio and try putting this fuel thing on the paramotor and making it beautiful and lightweight and nice colors and see if it's going to work. Yeah. You know, it's exciting. And every day, probably the most exciting is when you take a, you know, here's a mold for a, a fuel bladder I made. Uh, you know, and you set it up with, with carbon and uh, resin and you do it the night before and then you clamp it all together and then you leave it and then you go home and you have dinner and watch, you know, a hockey game on TV yeah. and go to sleep. And then next morning it's like breakfast. Oh my God, I got to go undo that mold and see how it looks. One of the most exciting things there is, is, is working with carbon yeah. uh, and, and creating parts. Yeah, for sure. The, well, the, the the act of creation is it's a holy act. It, it is. is, right? It to is a spiritual nothing, thing. Nothing, right. and it gets drawn out of us through a need. Yeah, and I think that's big because people often, mostly it seems, receive need as that's a problem, and they end up getting stuck on the problem, complaining about the problem. All they talk about is the problem. Like, well, how about we talk about the solution? How about we talk about the alternative to what sucks right over here called what rocks, you know, and it doesn't exist yet. And it's not going to exist and we still, until we start talking about it and letting ourselves get passionate about it and change our emotions from this trapped place of, yeah, I did take a collapse and fall out of the sky and bust myself. But what can I do to not only make that not happen, but to fly where I feel more fearless and more joyful as a result of this creation. Right, right. And that's where the airlocks came in. Well, it's one of the things, but I mean, your new frame. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many new possibilities. I mean, I've seen some, uh, I saw an acro set that they did in uh, Voss, Norway, where they did uh, debag deployment of, of uh, acro paragliders, did these wild sets, and then he went ahead and cut away and opened up what looked like a big seven cell reserve uh, from a, uh, it was a direct bag static line deployment off his paraglider. Like, oh, instead of a junky round parachute for his paraglider, he has a real parachute. Hey, I, that's what I want you to make. I want you to make me a, a, a base canopy reserve with um, a cutaway system. It, it can be done. It definitely can be done. I mean, the, the three ring has to be upside down and it gets a little bit weird, but it doesn't mean well, that's, it can That's your, your specialty right there. Yeah, it, it definitely can be done. Absolutely. Okay. Because a round parachute is boring. And yes. if, if I can buy a used, like a, a seven cell a two, 220 base canopy and we can pack it, uh, or you, you know, I'll leave that to you. But Well, I don't know all of it yet, but that's, that's the fun part. Um, is, is you go, all right, what's the need? What's the value of this, of this satisfaction of this need? And in this case, is, I can flare for landing. I, you know, I can steer this thing and avoid obstacles. And, right, because know. the scariest thing is when you pull around is like you're going straight down. You can't steer that thing. And, you know, what, what if you get uh, you know, speared by a tree or something? It's a valid fear, right? And so, so you can get stuck in that fear. Uh, or you can, I mean, from, the, from right now, it's like, okay, well, I don't have a complicated system like that where I get to cut away and open a big, big square. So I can reduce my risk by learning how to fly well, by flying good products, by having a reserve that does work, but I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on that. I'm going to pick my day. I'm going to have, you know, good con you know, pitch control, active pitch dampening and, and, and be as smart as I can. But I mean, how do you deal? That's an important question we come back to on this show a lot is, how do you deal with the uncontrollable risk? Where you've done everything you can think of, and now I have to take off without fear. I gotta leave the fear on the ground, otherwise I'm gonna create the danger from my, my cognition and my, my vibe. How do, how, how do you launch without fear anyway, knowing that there's still some danger? No, fear is good because fear creates respect for the air, for gravity, for the ground. And I think it's important um, in these aerial sports to have that respect. Yeah. Or you're going to do stupid stuff and end up dead. Yeah. And uh, uh, you've got to manage that fear. 
Yeah. And I think the more prepared and the more experience you have, the better you can manage that fear. Sure. Yeah. I still think we have to make a choice. And not pay attention to the, the, the mental loop of the movie of the crash, you know, the possible crash. It's not really happening. So what am I really afraid of? I'm afraid of a possibility. And yet if I dwell on the possibility, I increase it. I increase the likelihood of it. Absolutely. Because you, 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 you mentally make it real. And then it manifests itself in reality. Somehow it does. Somehow it seems to do that. And so it, it, what, what comes to my mind when we talk about this is, yes, fear in a flash of awareness can be very beneficial for us. To me, it's the dwelling on it. You know, two seconds of fear, okay. 20 seconds of fear, mm, now it becomes a problem. Five yeah. minutes of fear, walk away. <laughs> you've, you know, you're about to walk into a trap that you've set. Oh, there goes the gravity. Look out for it. Yeah, metal pieces flying. Well, they say gravity is not just a good idea. It's the law. <laughs> <laughs> on this planet. <laughs> yeah, on this planet anyway. Yeah, it's true, right? Okay. I, I would love to have you back on here. Uh, I'll, I'll come back. Well, I mean, you're, you're one of the most interesting people I've met. I'm trying to invite folks that I feel uh, your perspective is a positive one. Well, good. You know who you should talk to is my new stepson, uh, Zach. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a downhill skater, pro downhill skater. And he's making trucks, right? Really cool. He's making trucks. He's making, he's the biggest manufacturer of bushings in the world, yes. skateboard bushings. He makes wheels now, trucks, Whoa. grip tape. And uh, he has an incredible Instagram account nice. uh, with more followers than any longboard company. And he, he is, he's brilliant. He started making bushing, bushings in his mom's kitchen when he was 16 <laughs> and has a success story like no other. Yeah. Never went to college Yeah, well, and uh, is traveling the world uh, racing downhill. Oh, on yeah. time. I love it. Yeah, it's these fearless entrepreneurs taking on the new model, you know, of our new economy where through the computer and through these lots of, you know, you can build a website and all these other things. You don't have to work for a big company. Some people will choose to, some people need to, but it's not absolutely uh, the only path. And, and uh, it is scary at first, but man, is it rewarding. Oh yeah. And, and once you've, ta you've tasted that freedom, uh, you can never go back to working for anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, let me talk to Zach. Uh, he'd be a great addition for this show. Absolutely. And if any of our listeners have, have ideas for, for guests that are, you know, like, like Robert and like Omar Al-Hajalan, you know, inspiring people who are positive, you know, positive thinkers that are visionaries, open-minded, cross-cultural communicators that, that uh, you know, that, that uh, can share an angle on the world that is very much needed in, in this time that is very dark for some. It's not dark for all, but it's one of the scariest times in history for lots of people. Yeah, I've never seen this country as divided as it is now and, and scared, and rightfully so. I mean, it's, it's a scary time. It is, but the fact that it is scary and potentially dangerous doesn't mean we have to get scared. It means we got to get down to war work. We got to get down to business and the details and take on uh, our own fear and then take on the problem after that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I haven't given up on any of us. Oh, no, no. I haven't either. Uh, to me, it's like, it's like Frank Zappa said. He, he put it nicely in the 60s. He said, uh, uh, politics is the entertainment arm of the military uh, industrial <laughs> campaign. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And if you look at it that uh, from that perspective, yep. it's much easier to 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 stomach it. I love it. Yep. And, and, and to add on top of that one, yes, and like Wavy Gravy said, if you don't have a sense of humor, it just isn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Right. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining. Uh, we'll be doing it again next Wednesday. So join us again for casual chat. I'm Brian Germain. Thank you all. Thank you for having me.